In this video, let's start exploring some of the other nodes in Shader Graph. We've constructed a basic glow effect shader highlighting some props in the sample default scene. In keeping with our sci-fi theme from the rest of the course, let's see how we can transform that glow shader into the start of a force field effect. And we'll learn how to use the time node in Shader Graph to introduce the concept of motion and make the glow start to pulsate. If you look at the various force field effects in many of today's games, you'll notice a common look even if they come in various shapes and sizes. Usually they have a translucent texture accented by a really hot rim glow. We've already learned how to produce that signature edge glow from our highlight shader, so let's see how we can adapt that to make a decent little sci-fi force field. We can continue working in the current sample scene, and I'll just disable everything in the workshop hierarchy except for the floor object, and let's turn off the props altogether. I've already generated the lighting, so go ahead and do that to get rid of any residual shadows. And make a directory called force field, then just stick everything in here. We'll make a shader graph and a material. Create shader PBR graph. And let's call it force field shader graph. And let's make a material to use this shader. Create material. And let's name this force field mat. Assign the force field shader graph as the shader for our material. And the other thing that I want to do is import some test geometry. A spherical object would be great, but the default sphere in Unity has some quirky UV layout, so that may impact us later. I'm just going to use a default sphere that I've generated inside of Maya. Import that FBX from the resources. It's just a simple sphere.fbx. It's in centimeters, so you'll want to adjust the import scale by a factor of 100 so that it's in meters. And then hit apply. Drag the sphere mesh into the hierarchy, and let's make it intersect the ground and make it look more like a big dome. And I'll center it roughly in the game view. Assign the force field mat material to the mesh render component. And okay, let's get started with our shader graph. Edit the force field shader graph. Just double click that and bring up the shader graph window. And here's our blank PBR graph. The cornerstone of the shader is still going to be the Fresnel effect. So let's create that Fresnel effect node. And I'll be rebuilding this from scratch, even though you might have created a subgraph in the previous video. It's probably just good practice if you're still relatively new to shader graph. So drop in the Fresnel effect node, math vector, Fresnel effect. Previously we connected this directly to the emission port to make the rim glow. And that makes our material default gray with this glowing white halo. This time, however, we want to make our force field shader see-through. So let's edit the PBR master so that's working in transparent mode instead of opaque. And apologies again for this weird refresh bug. We need to hit Save Asset periodically in this beta to flesh that out. Okay, so even in transparent mode, there's no real change until I modify the alpha property of the PBR master. Now, one quick thing that we can do is simply plug the output port of the Fresnel effect into the alpha input port as well. You're free to use the output port of a node more than once if necessary. And now our preview sphere is transparent in the middle and has a nice hot rim glow. Our rim glow is white, and you may remember that to give it some color, we need to add a color node and then use a multiply. So let's create a multiply node, mass basic multiply, and let's just insert that in between the Fresnel effect and the PBR master. And let's expose a color property in the blackboard to pass into the multiply. Hit the plus icon, create a new property. It's going to be a color. And let's rename this to rim color. And we want to connect this into our graph. So I'll just drag the rim color into the work area. That's an alternate way for creating a property node. And then we'll just connect that to the first input of the multiply. We should probably select a better default color than black. So I'm going to try a nice bold blue, 
And now our rim glow is this nice sci-fi blue that is transparent in the middle. If you really want the rim to glow hot, you can switch the color property to HDR to exploit the high dynamic range of colors. Increase the HDR colors intensity if you like, and that creates the impression that our shader is glowing, especially when the bloom post-processing is active. Save the asset and let's check it out in the editor. And here you go, our force field shader and material get updated, and you can see our force field effect starting to take shape. And it looks pretty decent so far. Now one thing that we could improve about the shader is that we can make it less static. The glow kind of sits there and doesn't change at all. A little bit of motion, even if it's subtle, always helps make the visuals come alive. So back in the graph window, let's figure out how to introduce a little bit of animation to our shader. We can close the preview and just shift everything over so we have a little more work area to play with. And let's first expose a property to adjust the rim power since we didn't do that before. Let's add a property to the blackboard. It's a vector one and let's call it rim power. Default it to two or two and a half, something around there. And let's drop that into the workspace and then feed that into the power input of the Fresnel effect. That should get us back to where we were before, except now we've exposed a little control to the user to adjust the size of the glowing rim. Now let's use a node that we haven't encountered yet, the time node, to create a little bit of subtle motion for our rim glow. And you'll find that node under input basic time. The first output port that says time puts out a floating point number that represents our current runtime in seconds. And this number is always increasing. Now what we want to do is drive the rim power using our game clock. And this way the rim glow won't stay static. Of course, we don't want to plug the time output directly into the power input. Our Fresnel effect becomes very thin and hard to see if we use large numbers in here. If you connect those, the Fresnel effect essentially shows up as black because the time value is just too large. What we can do is take advantage of the next couple of output ports below the time output. And we have two outputs labeled the sine of time and the cosine of time our basic trig functions. And those curves always oscillate between values of negative one and one. That's a little bit closer to what we want. So let's see what happens when we plug one of those into the Fresnel effect power input. Just wait for it to take effect. And there you go. We now have a little bit of motion in our glow. Essentially the sine function is oscillating between negative one and one and feeding that value into the rim power and you can see the glow animating in the preview windows. It just forms a big cycle. Of course, half the time the sign is returning a negative value, and that doesn't look so great when you pump that into the power. As we've already established, our rim power would look better if we could choose a slightly different range of values. And we can do that using another node in Shader Graph called the remap node. This allows you to change one range of values and map them to a different minimum and maximum. And you'll find that under math, range, remap. This takes a vector one, a single floating point number as input. And it has two vector twos as input ports as well. The in min max essentially describes the original range of our value. And the out min max defines what you wanna map those values to. So if you connect the sign of time output into the remaps input port, it's not super obvious, but the rim glow does change as we do that. The remap node by default remaps values to a different range. And you can see that this is now using a range between zero and one. If you were to visualize the sine wave, it will look something like this. The wave doesn't go negative anymore. And that's good, but those values still don't produce the best results for our rim glow. It'd be handier if we could just take this wave and shift it up by another unit, and then multiply its amplitude a little bit, like by a factor of two. And we can do that very simply by changing the out min max to a range of one and five. Now, if we did that, the motion is still being driven by the sine wave, but the remap node helps keep the rim glow a little bit thinner and narrower, a little bit closer to what we expect. All right, let's save the asset and check it out in the editor. And okay, great. 
Our sine wave is driving the rim glow with a subtle animation, but the remap node is forcing the glow effect to have a narrower halo. And that's sort of our desired look for our force field. Of course, you might want to give your user control over the output range using an extra property on the blackboard. So instead of a single floating point value to control the power, we now need a vector two to control the range. So let's delete our old rim power vector one, and we want to delete both the node and the property from the blackboard. And let's create a new vector two property, and that will be our new rim power. Default the range between one and five, since we know that range basically works. Then add the property node to the work area, and let's connect that to the out min max port. And now we're giving the user more control over the rim glow's range. We can essentially modify the sine wave's amplitude and offset the curve, and essentially change how thick or thin the glow effect can become as it animates. Slightly trickier is how do we change the frequency of this pulsing animation? If you were to look at the sine wave again, what we've done is this. We've shifted it up and changed the amplitude. To change how fast the glow effect pulses, we need to do something like this. Either make the wave broader and more spread out, or bunched up with a higher frequency. We're going to do this as a challenge, of course, and we want you to modify the sine wave's frequency by adding two extra nodes to the current graph. You'll probably also want to expose a vector one property in the blackboard called pulse speed or something to that effect. Now, if you're successful, you should be able to add a single control that can change how fast the rim glow fades in and out. Pause the video, go ahead and try that out. Resume playback if you're stumped or you found the solution. Welcome back. Currently, we're getting the sign of time from the time node. Unfortunately, this node does not allow us to alter the period of the sine wave, how close or how far apart the waves are spread out from one another. But we do have another node to generate a sine wave in shader wrap as well, and we're going to use that instead of the time node. So you'll find that under math, trigonometry, sine. If I pump the time output into this new sine node, and then I connect that in turn to the input port of the remap, that should be exactly where we started. This is just a different way of doing the same thing using an extra node. But by splitting the sine function into a separate node, I could also insert an extra multiply in here. So math basic multiply, and then we're just going to connect this through. If I multiply the time by some number before I stick those results into the sine node, then look at that. I'm going to be able to modify the rate that the rim glow pulses. So if you dial this to three, it becomes three times as fast, four is four times as fast, and so forth. Now I'm running out of room here, so maybe I can roll up some of these preview windows and make some space. Let's just tidy up a little bit. To make this a little more user accessible, we can add a vector one property to the blackboard. So plus vector one, and we'll call this property pulse speed. And we'll default it to say a value of three. Then we can drop this into the work area and make the output of pulse speed feed right into the multiply node. Okay, pretty cool. You can already see the effect in the preview windows. Our glow can now change how fast it pulses with just a single control. Save your shader graph asset. And let's go back to the editor. Now we have a force field with a slightly faster pulse. If you wanted to adjust the rim glow color, just choose whatever color you want. If you want to make it red, just click the color chip. You can modify the rim power to alter the min and max power of the Fresnel effect. And you also have this control for the pulse speed to make the rim glow expand and shrink on regular intervals over time. If you wanted to make the glow a little bit broader, you could use a range of zero and two for the rim power, and then that becomes a bit more pronounced. Or if you wanted to make it more subtle, you could choose a range between two and five just to make that thinner. The idea is that the force field is mostly invisible, but we see some kind of effect around the edges just so that we know it's there. 
And okay, that's starting to look like the effect that we're going after. In the next video, we'll explore some more nodes to see if we can add onto this force field shader and try to make it a little more interesting.